Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all for being here and being interested in your state, your country, the Constitution, and your God. Why do I want to be governor? Because I always wanted to sit in this big soft chair. <laughs> well, to tell you the truth, it's a job that has to be done. And my business experience, if you uh, don't know who I am, Taylor Haynes, I got a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. I have an MD. I'm board certified in adult pediatric urology. I did the first neonatal surgery done in Cheyenne, perhaps all of Wyoming. I have a cattle ranch. I'm, board cert I'm certified organic grass fed. I've been in the leadership of almost every organization that I've been affiliated with. Founded independent cattlemen of Wyoming and president, president of the board, regional vice president for Wyoming stock growers. Uh, RCAF board member, RCAF is a national organization for the family, farmer, and rancher. I'm on that board and a set down the director for Wyoming, Colorado, and Utah. I spent 12 years, two six-year terms on the board of trustees of the University of Wyoming. First appointed by Governor Geringer, and then appointed by, reappointed by Governor Friedenthal. On the board, I was vice president and chairman of fiscal and legal affairs, so I dealt with the budget for one of the largest state agencies and many of the legal issues as well. So, that's a few things. I was also on the board of directors of the Wyoming Nature Conservancy. And in the vein of the famous Chinese general, San Tzu, who said, know yourself and know your enemy. My time with the Nature Conservancy taught me a lot about how non-governmental outfits, how environmental groups, how they're working to grab land, how conservation easements work, and other things that I knew nothing about. But that knowledge really helped and protected uh, the members of independent cattlemen who would listen and pointed out to those who didn't listen why they're losing their ranches. So I've been faced with the federal government since Bill Clinton and Bruce Babb got in the office and they showed up out here trying to push us off the ranch. Well, I fought that along with stock growers, along with the, the then National Cattle Association and then with the newly formed RCAF group. Hillary came down the road with Hillary Care. So as a practicing physician, I dealt with that. My wife and I also run a third party administrator, so we deal with the health plans for companies that self-fund and partially self-fund. So we deal with Obamacare every day for our clients. And it's a chore, but we get it done so they can deliver the care and they can stay out of trouble with the feds. <clears throat> so it appears to me when I look back on my education and my training and my being recognized as a constitutional scholar, I've been prepared by the Lord, trained, educated, and pushed out here to lead our state to liberty, prosperity, and I can do it in a peaceful manner. Many of you have heard me talk about removing the federal land managers from Wyoming and other federal <laughs> And I had an excellent question in Du Bois yesterday. We have a nice packed house of seasoned citizens who know the score. And I pointed out that I've chased the federal government, the Fish and Wildlife Service to be specific, off my ranch in southeastern Wyoming and out of southeastern Wyoming with their initial attempt to list the prevalence metal jumping mouse as threatened. You never heard about it, you never saw it in the paper. Because I did that in the board, using my background in research and science, and using their data that they were presenting as evidence that this thing should be listed. When they realized that these were public meetings, and I continued to pound their evidence in public, they decided there were no threats to the mouse in Wyoming and they delisted it, and then they fired me from the committee. <laughs> so, there's a way to deal with the feds in the boardroom. And that's my experience as a senior executive leading my companies. You can't ground me strong-willed, well-educated people. You have to lead them. And in order to lead them, you have to have a vision that you believe in. And then you have to have a plan 
and experience in not only writing the plan, writing the plan, you gotta have the experience in executing the plan in business. And in my business career, I've been blessed. I haven't had all winners, but I've had three very good winners. And we're still running two, we sold one, and now we're running the last two, so I'm still actively involved in business, and I'm actively involved in trying to remove the federal government from our state. My, my experience then suggests that the only way for me to do that is to be governed. Because as I look at our former government, as a constitutional scholar, our former Republican government, Republican means representative. It comes from the Bible. You can read about it in Exodus. When Moses was trying to judge about 600,000 people, and back then they didn't count women and children for some reason. Judge between all the troubles from dark to dark, Jethro brought his wife and son to be with him, and he said, what are you doing? He showed him how to set them up in groups of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens, and solve their problems at the lowest level they possibly could. The Anglo-Saxons adopted that, and our founders, with their scriptural knowledge and their belief in God, and then their knowledge of the Anglo-Saxons, you, you may not know that Thomas Jefferson actually learned to speak Anglo-Saxon, so he could read their documents in their language. Therefore, we come from that strong Judeo-Christian ethic. That's who we are. And despite what Barack Obama said, we are a Christian people. And so despite all of my education, all of my experience in business, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to invoke the divine providence as governor and as a candidate to deliver us through these trials that we're facing, to roll back the evil that's trying to overtake us. And I will use my business experience and my education as well to administer the state. And I know how to do that as well. But those things are all about the grace of God. So as I ask for your prayers first, your political and financial support, and your vote, I'm going to also ask you to pray that the Lord will choose between his children to lead our state. And I can live with the Lord's decision. Thank you. Sports that I think is pretty important that a lot of people start to understand. Have you ever heard the old saying, if you think education is expensive, try ignorance? Amen. We have an educational system that starts at preschool and goes clear up through college and then permeates our law enforcement, it permeates our government, it permeates our military, and it's based in fallacy. I was in Rocky Mountain Sports the other day and one of the local uh, federal agents was in there, somebody I recognized, and the subject of Bunker Bill came up. And I uh, asked him, well, what he thought about it. He said, well, you know, uh, you know, I can do anywhere, anything I want anywhere in the country. I can go anywhere I want because I'm a federal agent and I have ultimate power. And I had to try to point out to him that that's not necessarily true, that there's been several county sheriffs in several states that have kicked the feds out of their county because states' rights trump federal authority. They started getting very upset about that. And uh, I started pointing out examples. One of the things I started pointing out, but in the middle of this little lecture that I was trying to teach him, he got angry and stormed out, so I was not able to teach him. And I think this is the point I'm making more strongly than anything else, is that people get a paradigm in their mind, they have a preconceived notion, and they don't want to be confused with any truth or any facts. Their minds may not. But the Constitution, the, the first seven articles were written, they were drafted, they were adopted, and there was a, a gentleman's agreement that a Bill of Rights should follow. Bill of Rights was ratified after the Constitution. It is one law. It is not ten laws. It is one law with ten articles, which we call the amendments. What do amendments do? They amend. 
which means anything that is before that amendment is that would be in contradiction to that amendment is null and void. The federal government is trying to flex their muscle in our state and every other state because of what they call the supremacy clause. If we read the writings of the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, the Supremacy Clause was the bone that they all wanted to pick on where they wanted to have the Bill of Rights written. The Supremacy Clause was amended ten times in one day with one law. And that is something that I think as governor that, you know, you need to, or as governor, the governor or candidate, you need to start to get out to people that if you want to get your, your freedoms back, they're based on our Bill of Rights, and the federal government does not get to trounce on those by saying, well, we have the Supremacy Clause. The U.S. Supreme Court doesn't get to do it. The Senate doesn't do it. The Congress doesn't do it. The President surely doesn't do it. But you have a matter of opinion. Unless you can point them to this document and show them in black and white, it's not opinion. It's historical fact. The amendments came after the articles. They amended the articles. There is no argument here. But how many people know that? So, done? <laughs> Pepper's telling me, that's enough. Don't you agree? Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a great point. And in fact, uh, I've been out in my business life and in, in guest lectures for now four years trying to teach the Constitution, along with Jeff Hines of the JBS Society. So, uh, first of all, as a candidate, one of the major points, as I mentioned first, is that I can move the federal government back to their constitutionally mandated position, using the Constitution and, of course, the Bill of Rights. But also in the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17, limits what the federal government can do. And it specifies the areas where they are supreme. And that's what the Supremacy Clause is. If you want to know where they're supreme, it's Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. So, uh, as governor, with that knowledge, it will be a chore because of the paradigm, but doable because I've done it as a simple little rancher. And you never heard about it. Tim, see if we can get a couple more questions here. Let's uh, <laughs> let's ask our let, let's make our questions a little shorter so that we can get more questions on the table before uh, Taylor runs out of time. <clears throat> Yeah, Taylor, as an educator for 25 years, I've talked to some teachers, and, and I've heard different answers about this, but as a governor, would you prefer an appointed director of education or an elected one? Oh, definitely the elected position, even though most states have gone away from it. <laughs> I was one of the first people to testify against 104, since 5104, and spent my own money to lobby to get people to sign it. Despite what might be out there, I have signed affidavits from the people that, who made it a point to get my signature first so that my followers in the various areas would sign the petition as well. Doctor. What's your view of the 14th Amendment? Well, the 14th Amendment is very interesting. It, it speaks to equal protection under the law, and I agree with that. But some people wonder if it made the slaves really free or not. But the practice of the 14th Amendment has been to make the slaves free and to speak to equal protection under the law. And so that's where I am. What about the historical fact that it was never legally ratified? Neither was the 16th Amendment. So what are we going to do about that? Yeah, but it never was, was never legally ratified. So, if you're saying one is more legal than the other, what's the precedent and paradigm and how do we cure it? I didn't say it was more legal, I said it had better history. Same, that's the same inference. Do you accept the 14th Amendment as properly ratified or not? No. Good, thank you. Another question? How do you feel about the 17th Amendment? 17th Amendment destroyed the function of the United States Senate. Now that the senators are popularly elected and they don't be appointed by our legislature, they have no function. 
They're just celebrities. <laughs> Okay, the second question first, because it's a little shorter answer. What can I do without the approval of the legislature? Everything that's already in statute, or already in the Constitution, which is the grand law of the land. And under the Wyoming Constitution, the governor's job is to faithfully enforce the statutes. So I can do those things. Now, the first part of your question, how do I work with the legislature, is really your question. So the legislature is a separate, powerful body of government. So I'm not your boss, I'm not your dictator. So I have to, first of all, be elected on the vision that I'm showing the people, which is to remove the federal government, which is to lead us to liberty, prosperity, and peace in the Constitution, protecting our god given rights. We all take the oath, so we start with the oath. And then we talk about how do we fix things in Wyoming. But also, once we have legislation that we need, We'll have town hall meetings around the state, invite the people to participate long before we get to the session, so that then we have government by the people back in the equation, and that's what's been lost. Had we had that, we would be in a much different place today. So that's how I'm going to work in the legislation. Dr. Ains, uh, I have a question. Right now we have, uh, with the wolf, uh, is being challenged or, or listing, delisting is being challenged in both Washington, D.C. and uh, it has been remanded back to Wyoming. But, uh, I would like to know how you would propose we resolve uh, the, the problems and conflicts that we have with species such as the wolves and grizzly bears that have yeah. recovery goals and surpassed those goals for decades. If in fact something does come out of D.C. Uh, that, that throws wolves back on the endangered species list. How would you propose, as a governor, you would address that? Well, again, that's an easy question. First of all, whatever comes out of D.C., whether it's the executive branch or the Congress, has the authority on the ground in the sovereign state. I will treat the wolf under the Wheaton Pest Act in 1973 as a predator. You can protect yourself and your property anywhere, anytime, without repercussions. Done. The grizzly bear is a game animal and a predator. You can protect yourself if you're attacked. But we will also have hunting seasons based on the population, etc., set by the wildlife biologists at the game and fish. Period. Okay. Excellent question. The governor can't change education by fiat. The governor has to change education by leadership. So, with the elected superintendent of public instruction, if I'm elected governor, I'm elected on the vision that I'm proposing, and we all take the oath to uphold, defend the Constitution, and protect our people. My vision for education is to go back to a time when the teachers could teach, mentor, discipline, and nurture. Two kids born on the same day don't progress at the same rate, don't have the same gifts. When I came along, the teachers could deal with that differently, and you have to do a great job for both kids. So I will encourage the Wyoming Department that we go in that direction. And again, you bring the people into the equation with town hall meetings. And so the teachers, the parents, and the local schools will then reshape education to the system that produces our astronaut program, the system that produced Microsoft, Apple, the system that made us the greatest technological, economic, and the most generous people in the history of civilization. That's where I'm going with education. Okay, 
campaigns, uh, a lot of folks come to me and hire me out. Uh, they know through my support for you and somehow they're afraid to ask you direct questions. But getting back to SF 104, um, you, you touched on part of it about you actually signed affidavits. Could you expand on that so we can either you know, debunk or at least address the, uh, the uh, assertion that you didn't support um, the opposition of SF 104 and also that you made a comment that uh, SF 104 might make education better. I mean, this is what's floating around. Bro, I never made that comment. The context of the conversation was about the constitutionality of the process. And I wanted to keep it there so people would sign the petition. I was asked if I thought it was good or bad. And I specifically did not deal with that. Because now you've got a separate debate. So are you debating the bill? Or are you debating whether or not the legislature can take away our right to vote, can void somebody's contract with the people? I wanted to keep it focused on that. Shorty, do you have those? She has copies of the signed affidavit here. And as far as um, well, the affidavit. Oh, this is the affidavit. Yeah, they're here. Okay, great. If uh, we have a bad type incident in Wyoming, are you going to stand in the middle of the bullseye with them? I did not plan that question. <laughs> We're not going to have an bad type incident. Incident. We're not governed because the BLM and the Forest Service, the Fish and Wildlife Service, are all done managing land alone, along with the Park Service, the Bureau of Rec and Corps Engineers. They don't have any constitutional authority in that. Right after you do, are you going to stand in the bullseye? Not only will I stand, I had dinner with a lone welder in UN County and his family and, and asked his permission that if the EPA shows up with U.S. Marshals or whomever, if I can bring with me the people who have volunteered to stand with him in his yard, and I have his permission, and I'll be there in the first person. I was carrying petitions for another sponsor because I missed the opportunity to be a sponsor. So I just had some petitions, but I wasn't a sponsor. The, the SF 104 Right, right. And at town halls in uh, both uh, Saratoga and uh, Rollins. Okay. Um, okay, well, I, I have been telling people that you weren't because you were not on <coughs> as a volunteer. I'm not on as a sponsor. Or a volunteer, because I, I try Or a circulator, because that, that was the stipulation that the, those right. are the rules. So perhaps, perhaps I was outside the rules. So you, so you were outside the rules, is yeah. what I say. Right. And, and so therefore jeopardize the entire effort. What I said, what I have been trying to counter is that, that you said that you carry a petition, and I, as the, the coordinator, leader of the image referendum effort, and then manager of all the volunteers, knew that your name wasn't on there. So I've been telling people that you were not a circulator trying to clear up at that point, saying perhaps you carried the UCC petition in science. So what I would say to that, Dr. Haynes, is that, that you jeopardize the effort of the people by um, carrying a petition without being a valid sponsor. Um, well, I apologize for that because I didn't know the rules. And when I carried, I signed a petition to Cheyenne, then when I carried, a few of other places. I didn't realize that I couldn't do that. And so if anything... The petition circulator that you got them from would have known that because um, they had attended this, the petition circulation right. training. And then the second point I wanted to clear up too was that I understand that you did announce on, on KDAP a couple times about our referendum effort and, and did forward it in advance that way. 
However, I'm not, I'm not familiar with any monetary funds, as you've addressed, that, were, that came from, from you for that effort, because that largely came out of my own pocket. Well, the, the good people of Park County are the ones that, that uh, rallied together and came up with the money for the petition printing itself. Park County residents, and then the Constitution Party picked up the rest of the tab, and then as I traveled the state, that came out of my own pocket. So you don't think you don't think my travel expenses count? I I wasn't aware of any travel that you did for that. I see. Well, uh, thinking that it would be better to divide our efforts and not all be in the same place at once, I did travel, and there are people here who know that. If that's still a good issue. Then that's your teddy bear. Okay. Not a teddy bear. Just pointing out that you, you jeopardized the effort of people by by that. Um, I was a petition driver for Fremont County. We did no training. Um, I do know that there was petitions handed out and on the ballot uh, box. I had people under me that were signed under me, but there was people that uh, the same as Taylor Haynes that was taking that petition around, and then we had it. Uh, all certified and uh, documented. And you were a valid circulator. Yeah. And, and, and then and you worked at the training. Dr. Cummings would have testified to the fact that there was a centralized training in Casper that many individuals did show up to to get the, the rules on that. Obviously, what the law did Well, Dr. Angel sounds like you've got some work to do on that one, doesn't it? Well, perhaps. Perhaps. I was at that so-called training session in Casper. It was probably the worst training session I ever attended. Very little information was given out. No printed material was given out. I was very disappointed. Okay, do we have any more questions for? Thanks, Kip. Uh, Dr. Haynes was talking about uh, getting the federal government out of Wyoming. It sounds difficult, but it can be done. There are 11 states banded together under the American Lands Council out of Utah. I've got some literature over here. I've talked to Dr. Haynes about it. He supports the effort. But when a forest supervisor tells a county sheriff, the Fourth Amendment doesn't apply to me, we have got to take this movement very seriously. We, we have time for about one more question. This is a follow-up to uh, what Representative Halverson just asked. Um, you mentioned about pushing the federal government back uh, constitutionally, but since they have no respect for the Constitution, <laughs> how do you plan on handling that? Because the sheriff, excellent question, if you didn't hear it. Since the federal government does not respect the Constitution, how can I use the Constitution to push it back? Is that right? Uh, first of all, you get your sheriffs on board. And that's going to require a constitutional class that I already have designed and set up. I won't teach it, I'll participate in it. So I don't talk down anybody. So the sheriff is the highest law enforcement officer in each county. And Mac Prince, which overturned the Brady Bill, also did some other things. Judge Scalia pointed out that the federal government has no authority to dictate to the ships. No federal agency, federal law officer, etc. So when I tell them that they're done taking official action on the ground in Wyoming, should they try that, they'll be arrested. It's just that simple. They know it and I know it. So that's how we do it. Okay, thank you. I think we're all right, but we're not under the speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you.